So that's the kind of thing I do. I kind of find topics that interest me. My background is in particle physics, um, but I just write about maths or cosmology or anything that interests me. And um, <clears throat> back in the late 1990s, I got interested in cryptography, and I wrote this book, code book, which went all the way back to ancient Egypt and, and right through to uh, um, the Elizabethan era, the Victorians, the rise of the telegraph, the First World War, right through to the internet. And um, in the back of the book, there were um, 10 coded messages. And the idea was that people have read a book about codes, now they can break some coded messages. And um, that, that was, you know, it was a real competition. And um, let me see, here, here the, the competition, there was a prize of 10,000 pounds for whoever could break all 10 codes. And eventually the competition was won. Um, I tried to write the check in pig pen cipher in the hope the bank wouldn't cash it, but it didn't quite work. Um, eventually it was won by a team of, of Swedish uh, cryptographers, computer scientists, pure mathematicians working together. They were the people that cracked all 10 codes. Um, and they won what was called the cipher challenge. And um, that's what I was going to talk about this morning. I was going to race through the cipher challenge and tell you about some of the codes that were in it, particularly the Enigma code here. Um, as you can see, it started off with ancient simple ciphers, so even school kids could crack those. Uh, but by the time it got to the end, it was pretty tough. And so these Swedish guys who won the competition really, really dedicated uh, a year of their lives to cracking this code. Um, so the first code, very simple, um, the kind of code you might have used as a kid where you substitute every letter for a different letter. Um, this code, this type of code was unbreakable for thousands of years. The first person to figure out how to break it was an Arabic mathematician in Baghdad, a guy called Al-Kindi. And this is the oldest known manuscript we have on code breaking. It was found in Istanbul, but it was originally written in, in Baghdad. And in this ancient manuscript written by Al-Kindi, philosopher, mathematician, he explains very simply that every letter has a personality. Particularly, it has a frequency. So in English, E is very common, and then T, and then A, and so on. And whatever you swap a letter with, the, the new symbol, the new character adopts the old personality. So if you can spot the personality, if you can spot the frequencies, you can crack the code very easily. So that was stage one, pretty simple. Thousands of people must have broken it, and the competition was underway. Um, stage two and three and four were similar, uh, but more sophisticated. Um, the first tough stage was five. Stage five is what's known as a book cipher. And a book cipher is a real challenge. It took people six months to break this code. Um, the way a book cipher works is I pick a book. I could pick any book in the world. Let's imagine I pick Tale of Two Cities. Um, I number every letter in the book. So typically a book might be a million letters. I number it one to a million, okay? As, I, as I've done here, one, 17, and up to a million probably. Let's say my message is meet me at midnight. So what have I, how have I encrypted Meet Me at Midnight? Well, the M, I find an M in my book. Here's an M in the book. It's a 17th letter. So I replace the M with a 17. E, uh, there's an E here. It's the eighth letter. I replace E with an eight. Now, I don't want to replace E with eight over and over and over again because that's going to be easy to break. So I find another E in the book. Um, there's an E over here at the 10th position. I put a 10 here. So every time I come to an E, I replace it with a different number. Therefore, there's very little repetition, and therefore, it's a very hard code to break. The only way you'll break it is if you can guess which book I've written, uh, which book I've used as a key. And so to break this code up here, you had to work out which book I'd used. If I picked a book at random, it would have been impossible. Um, but I picked uh, one of my own books. I picked Fermat's Last Theorem. Um, but I, the reason it took six months for people to work that out was that I didn't number it from the beginning. OK, um, because, because I was trying to be fair, because if you've got the Dutch edition of Fermat's Last Theorem, it starts differently. If you've got the Spanish edition of Fermat's Last Theorem, it starts differently. It's an international competition. So I picked a piece of Fermat's Last Theorem from my book, which is the same in every edition. Um, it's a piece of the book that must be just a few hundred characters long. It's a piece of the book that's so famous that even if you don't have the book, you can find it online. And if you apply, apply those criteria, you work out that the, the key text is Fermat's marginal note. 
Uh, if you don't know the story, Fermat solved a problem, a great problem, which is now known as Fermat's last theorem, but he never told us the answer. He just wrote a little note which said, I have a marvelous solution which this margin is too narrow to contain. And then for 350 years, people tried to find the proof. And that little note is a few hundred characters long. It's incredibly famous, so you'll find it on the web, and it's written in Latin. So whichever la edition of my book you have, you'll find that Latin key text. Hank marginis, exiguatis, non capra. This margin is too narrow con to contain it. So if you number that, 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 that note by Fermat, and you transcribe the, 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 the numbers there to the corresponding letters, you can break the code. Took people six months to do that. Um, <clears throat> The first guy who succeeded was a, uh, a Cambridge mathematician called Andrew Plater. And um, there were various bulletin boards where people would discuss the competition. And um, I would sometimes drop into these bulletin boards and see what people were saying. And when Andrew Plater cracked this after six months, there was a huge amount of discussion. You know, what is it? How come Andrew Plater's so smart? How come he's figured this out and we still don't know? Well, why is he one step ahead of everybody else? And this conspiracy theory began to emerge, um, which was Andrew Plater is in Cambridge. I, I was in Cambridge uh, uh, as a graduate student. Uh, Andrew Plater did his PhD in Cambridge. I did my PhD in Cambridge. And people began to think about what could the key text be? What, 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 was, what was it that gave Andrew Plater this extra step? And um, completely misunderstanding what the key text was, uh, people, for the first time ever, went to the library in Cambridge and read my PhD thesis. Um, <laughs> never, never before or since. Um, so that was stage five. Um, stage six was, uh, was actually probably easier than stage five. Um, but stage seven was uh, 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 trickier again. And st stage seven was First World War. Stage eight was Second World War. Stage eight was the Enigma cipher. And um, obviously, this is the most famous encryption system in history. Um, here you can see it being used uh, in the Second World War um, by General Guderian in one of his communications vehicles. Uh, it's operated by three people. Typically you have um, somebody here reading the message, somebody here typing it into the machine, it's like a, a typewriter. Lights light up, so you type in hello and the lights A, P, V, Z, Q might light up. So this guy writes down A, P, V, Q. ZQ, gives them to the radio operator, the radio operator sends APV ZQ, at the other end you reverse the process. <coughs> you type in APV ZQ and the lights hello light up. So it's a three person process all revolving around this machine here. See it more closely here, here's the keyboard and here's the lamp board that lights up. Um, and I'm fortunate enough that I, um, I own an Enigma and we have it here. So Jamie, if we can switch to the camera, that would be great. Hopefully, we can get a close-up look of it. Um, so this is a genuine machine from... Uh, it was actually built before the Second World War. So the Germans, um, in the First World War, they could see the revolution in communication. Radio was allowing people to transmit messages across battlefields, across seas and oceans, um, incredibly quickly, uh, and sending information in very large volumes. So if you had this technical revolution in communication, you needed a technical revolution in encryption as well, something that could encrypt quickly and in large volumes, and that's what the Enigma did. Um, so this one was built before the Second World War in preparation uh, for, for, well, not in preparation, but, but by the time the Second World War broke out, the Enigma was there, ready to be used. Um, so here's the keyboard, here's the lamp board, and if I type in, let's say I type in the letter E, um, e, it's a little bit unreliable, but we'll see how... Oh, e is encrypted as R, okay? Now, if I type E again, um, it comes out as a V. Type E again, Y, G, B, T. So it's, it's, a, it's a random letter generator, okay? Um, I'm putting in the same input, but I'm getting a pseudo-random output. So why, uh, what's creating this pseudo-random output? Well, we can look inside... What's happening is that the wires go from the keyboard up the side and into these three rotors here. One, two, three. And I can take these rotors out. 
There are three of them on a, on a spindle, but they're all the same. And on this one, you can see there are 26 contacts. And there are 26 contacts on the reverse side. But in between the contacts on this side and this side, um, the wiring is like spaghetti. So when you type an A, it goes in at the top but it might come out as an E on the side. It might go in here as an E, it might come out there as a W. So it is the scrambled spaghetti wiring inside here that does the encryption, that changes the path of the electricity and dictates the output. Now that's fair enough, but um, it doesn't explain why the letters change, okay? It explains why E might be an R, but it doesn't explain why the next time it might be a V. And the reason why that happens is every time you type a letter, <coughs> the rotor moves one position. Now, A still goes in at the top, but that's now a different contact. So it follows a different electrical path, okay? Type again, it moves, goes in at the top, follows a different electrical path. So it's the motion of that rotor that changes the encryption. And when that does a full revolution, it kicks the middle one one place. So it's the, it's the dynamism of this that really generates the pseudo-random output. And if I, if I operate the machine with the uh, window open, you should be able to see the rotor just click over. Um, there it goes. Oh, let me go back to E. There we go. I think we just saw the middle rotor kick over there. There we go. And then when the middle rotor has done a full revolution, which takes a very long time, it kicks over the third one and so on. So um, that's how the machine works. Um, now, if you want to decode a message, um, let's say I send you a message. I'm going to send you the message OK. O gives me an X. K gives me a D. So OK is XD. Now, if you want to decode that message, you need to have the machine, obviously, but you need to have your machine set up in the same way. Okay, that's a really important thing. Like any encryption system, you have the algorithm, which is the enigma, but you also have the key, which is the setting of the enigma. And the enigma can be set up in, in a huge number of ways. Um, each ro Well, there are three rotors I showed you. Those rotors can be switched around. Three rotors can be found in six positions. Um, each rotor can have a different orientation of 26. So that's 26 cubed. 26 cubed, I think, is about 17,000. Times the six permutations is about 100,000. Um, where one rotor kicks the next one um, in its orientation, you can vary. And so that's another factor of 26. So that's 100,000 times 26 is 2.5 million. Second rotor can be varied. That's 50 million. Third rotor doesn't have anything to kick. So that's the end of that. But essentially, the drum section I showed you in the middle has 50 million settings. And to make things even worse, at the very front, um, you probably can't see this on the camera, so I'll just rotate it. Um, you've got these plugs here. Now, the plugs are very simple. They just swap letters. If you plug A with uh, W, every time you type A, it follows the electrical path of W. Every time you type W, it follows the electrical path of A. And uh, there are only 20 cables. Um, and there are 20 cables to go in 26 holes. And I think there are 100 million, million different ways to do that. So that's 100 million, million different ways to plug the cable. On its own, that's not secure because it's not dynamic. But it gives you this 100 million, million. And then you couple that with the 50 million settings of the rotor. Okay? So once we have a machine, if we set it up in the same way, then we should be able to decode our message. Let's try that. Um, the message was um, OK, and it went to XD. Is that right? I think it was XD. Um, the rotors moved, so I need to put the rotors back two slots. One, two. And now if I type XD, if it was XD, I hope it was, um, then that should give me OK. OK. So encryption and decryption is simple if you've got the machine and um, if you've got it set up the right way, okay? Um, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint in a second, but before I do that, does anybody have any questions while I've got the machine open? Um, 
I don't think we have a roving mic, but if you shout a question, I can try and repeat it. Um, nobody. Yeah. <coughs> So my, my question was, what steps did the German military take to destroy uh, a machine in the case of a position being overrun? Fine. So, so it, in a way, the Germans didn't care if the machines were stolen because inevitably they were going to get stolen. A double agent being overrun, raiding a U-boat. Um, and and the, the, the British only needed one machine. Once you've got one machine, you know what you're dealing with. And they got that one machine pretty quickly. Um, the really precious thing is the key setting. So every month, um, let's say we're in North Africa, we're in one communications network, every month, everybody in our network gets a sheet of paper um, with all the settings for every day of the month. Rotors in this position, rotors in this orientation, plugs plugged this way for each day. And if the British could get hold of that, then that, you know, they, then if they got hold of it early in the month, they could decrypt for the rest of the month. Um, so that, the, 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 um, the Germans knew that if they were raided, then they had to destroy that piece of paper. And so it was printed on water-soluble ink. And certainly in the Navy, they would have a bucket of water next to the machine and that would just get plunged into the water as quick as possible. Um, I think as a raiding party took, 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 took over something like this, they may go for the machine. But really, the precious objects was, was the key material. Anybody else? Y yeah. So there's a gentleman here, if we have a mic. Is there anybody else? And we can get a mic to you ready. So what's <coughs> that semicircular thing next to the rotors? Up here? Yeah. OK, so that's the power setting. So I've got it on um, hell. I don't think you can probably see that which is German for bright. Um, and that's Dunkel, the dark settings. If you want to save your battery, that's off. Um, Zamler, uh, I, I don't know what Zamler means, but it means external output. So you've got two contacts here. If your battery's flat, you can power it externally. Um, it's, it's nicely engineered. If, there are lots of things that could go wrong. Um, the rotor contacts may not work. The keys may not work. A bulb might go. Um, so one of the things you can do if you want to test the machine, um, and everything's moving, everything's dynamic. So one of the things you can do is um, if you keep your key down, then the rotors don't move. So uh, there's something wrong there. OK, so once I identify a problem, I can open up the machine. If I think it's the bulb, um, I won't take a bulb out of here, but I've got spare bulbs up here. Um, these bulbs are sort of 80 years old now. Um, if I want to test a bulb, I can just pop it in here. And that tells you that bulb's working. Um, if, um, if I'm working late at night and I'm worried that a flash of light might catch a, a sniper's um, eye, um, there was a, a little plate here, a little dark green plate probably looks quite black from where you are, but it's just a green plate. I can put this over the letters, and then if I type a letter, it's much fainter, so it just doesn't catch a sniper's eye quite so easily. Um, so it's a nicely engineered machine, and um, as I say, this one is about 80 years old. Um, any last questions? Yeah, gentlemen here, and then one over there. Does that mean every individual message that was sent, they had to set it back to the original starting conditions for those days? OK, so the w I, I've slightly um, I've simplified things a bit. Um, I've so what would happen if I'm communicating with you, we've got our machine set up the same way because we've got the same network and the same piece of paper. The first thing that I send you is maybe the letters ABC. And you get ABC. <coughs> what ABC tells you to do is to reset your rotors to one, two, three. And I reset my rotors to one, two, three. So now we've got a special setting for our channel.
Now, if I want to send a message to somebody else later in the day, I go back to my original setting, and I might send them MAB, 1312. So there was a day setting, and the day setting was used to establish a message setting. So yeah. And then one last question, um, just uh, yep. two questions over here. Yeah, uh, could the Germans have made this uncrackable with a small change to how they designed it? Could they have made it uncrackable? Um, it, it, was pr it was pretty formidable. It was really a strong machine, and it was silly mistakes that, that made it um, vulnerable. So, for example, um, one of the things... Um, if we can just... Can we just go to the slides for a second, Jamie? Um, this is a simplified Enigma. And, and you can see here, that's my keyboard. That's my output. I type a B. It comes out as an A. I type B again. The rotor's moved, so it comes out as a C. I type B again. The rotor's moved. It comes out as an E. Okay? That's, that's what I was trying to explain with the Enigma. There was, it's actually slightly different to that. What happened was you'd have a keyboard. It would go through the three rotors. So this is now kind of two-dimensional version. When it went through the three rotors, and this is the plug board, I've swapped A with B here. Um, if I type B, it goes through here, through here, through here, up here, up here, up here, up here, up here, up here. And this is called a reflector. This is the, the reflector. So it goes in here, and the reflector sends it back through the three rotors. Oh, gosh, where is it? C, great. Now, the thing about the reflector is because the reflector sends the signal back down a different path, no letter can be encrypted as itself, okay? Because if, if this has come from B and it goes back down a different path, it can't go back to B. So B is never encrypted as B, A never encrypted as A, and so on. Now, that doesn't seem like a big problem. But one day, there was a, a woman called Mavis Beatty, one of the code breakers. She was trying to crack a message. She was looking at this message. It was obviously gobbledygook. It was... German that had been encrypted, and, um, and she looked at this message, and she noticed that, it, that in the 300 characters, there wasn't one W. Now, if this is a pseudo-random output, one in 26 characters should be a W. So how can you have an output that's devoid of Ws? Well, the only way you can get an output that's devoid of Ws is if your input is W 300 times. And that's what had happened. Somebody had typed in W 300 times. Now, and Mavis had cracked the code. Now, it's not the most interesting message in the world, but once you know the input, 300 Ws, once you know the output, what you've got in your hand, you can work out the machine settings. And once you know the machine settings, you can crack other code sent that day. And um, there was a message that day sent about an attack on the British fleet at Alexandria. The British fleet were warned, and it was the first Allied victory in the Mediterranean. Um, now... The problem there was that somebody sent W 300 times. They, they, they sent such a regimented, silly message. That, that's what gave Mavis the clue to break it. If they didn't send such a silly message, then Enigma would have been much stronger and, and almost unbreakable, perhaps. Um, now, why would somebody send W 300 times? Uh, the reason for that was that um, if you and I have got an unbreakable code, Nobody has any hope of knowing what we're saying, but what they can do is count how many messages we send. And if we send one today, one on Thursday, one on Friday, ten on Saturday, they know something big is going to happen on Sunday. So that's called traffic analysis. So to combat traffic analysis, we send ten messages every day. Then the traffic is flat. Um, and so when somebody did the 300 Ws, they were just contributing to their quota for the day. And... Um, but if they'd have done it in a random way, that would have been fine. So it was silly mistakes like that that really helped break the enigma. Um, sorry, and one last question. Oh, sorry. Uh, <coughs> do we know who invented the enigma machine? Yeah, it was invented by a guy called Arthur Sherbius, um, who, um, I suppose he could see what was happening with radio. He could see the potential for um, new communications technology and, and encryption technology. Um, there was a Dutch version, I think, and a Swedish version, and an American version, um, similarly electromechanical. Um, but those companies all went out of business because there just wasn't the market for these kind of machines. Uh, but sh and, and Sherby's almost went out of business. He tried a diplomatic version that had a printer attached, um, but, but he was rescued by the fact that 
the Germans began to militarize. And once they began to do that, every railway station, every um, U-boat, every air base, every army unit needed a machine. So, um, but he died, I think he died just before the Second World War in a horse uh, carriage accident. Um, but he did, he did live to see his machine um, become a, 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 an in integral part of the German military. And it was an integral part because um, if you're going to do things like Blitzkrieg, if you're going to have coordinated attack from land, sea, and air, you need to have coordinated and secure communication. So that's the kind of thing the Enigma would do. Um, four minutes left. Right, let me race through this. Um, I've talked quite a lot about Enigma and how it was broken. I'll, I'll just mention one thing um, about Enigma before I finish, which is that um, the code breakers, people like Mavis, people like Alan Turing, Gordon Welshman, Hugh Alexander, um, obviously didn't get the credit that they deserved um, at the time because all of this was top secret. And I'd encourage you to go and see the film, The Imitation Game. Um, there are some things in it that are f fundamentally and horribly wrong. Um, but it's a great film. So, for example, they, they say the machine that broke the Enigma was called a bomb. W w it was a bomb, but they call it a computer. And they say Turing invented this computer, but he didn't. Cur Turing in invented the concept of a computer, and somebody at Bletchley did build a computer, but it was to build a different type of encryption machine. So the spirit of the film is great, but the facts of it slightly uh, unfair. Also, I think, I think Hugh Alexander gets painted as a as kind of an antagonist towards Turing. And I, I think he gets quite a bad rap, um, which is slightly unfair because his family is still alive and, and his descendants uh, probably would like to think of him more fondly. So there are some things that are wrong with the film, but it's a great film, go and see it. But as I said, and, and that film also means that these people get the credit that they never got at the time. Um, they didn't get it after the war, they didn't get it in the 50s, they didn't get it in the 60s. It wasn't until the 1970s that the Enigma story became public. The, it wasn't until the 1970s that people knew that Bletchley Park, um, where the code breaking happened, even existed. So why was it that Enigma was kept secret for 30 years? Why was the cracking of the Enigma kept secret for 30 years? And the reason for that is very simple. As the Allies swept through Europe, um, the British collected these machines, and they collected literally hundreds of them. And they brought them all back to London. They brought them all back to Whitehall and kept them in the basement in Whitehall. And then civil servants in Whitehall would ring up other countries, friendly countries like Canada and Australia. And they would say, look, we've got these German Enigma machines. And they're brilliant. The Germans swear by them. They're uncrackable. Why don't you have some? <laughs> and so the British gave away these machines to their friends so that they could then spy on them subsequently. So that's why Enigma was such a secret. Um, so uh, back, back to the Cypher Challenge. I'll just finish with one very quick point on the Cypher Challenge, um, which is that um, so the Swedes, uh, there was, there were, the, the encryption got, there was a DES encryption from the 1970s. There was an RSA encryption. Uh, and eventually, they, these were all cracked. And they were cracked by these Swedish um, mathematicians, engineers, computer scientists, and so on. And in 19, no, in 2000, I actually went to Sweden, to Stockholm, to give them their prize, the 10,000 pound check. I gave a lecture on how I made the codes. They gave a lecture on how they broke the codes. And then we all went out to dinner. And at dinner, they explained something to me that, was, um, that I, I hadn't realized. Um, the final stage of the encryption involved something called triple DES. So DES is kind of breakable. It's from the 70s, data encryption standard. Triple DES is unbreakable. You encrypt with one key. You decrypt with the second key. So you decrypt it with the wrong key so it gets even more messed up. And then you re-encrypt it with the first key to get it in the right format. That's triple DES. It's unbreakable. To break my code, to break this, um, I'd encrypted these two keys using RSA. Um, and so you had to break RSA, a, a kind of a... A, sim uh, a very challenging version of RSA, but not obviously unbreakable. So that was what people were supposed to do. Break my RSA, factor some number into primes. Once they cracked RSA, they'd get these two keys, and then they could unpick the triple DES. Because unless you know the keys of triple DES, it's unbreakable, OK? So I'd encrypted my message this way. Encrypt with one, decrypt with two, re-encrypt with one. 
That's what I thought I'd done at least. What I'd actually done with my message was this. I'd encrypted with the first key, and then I had decrypted with the first key. And then I, re -encrypted, then I encrypted with the second key. So this is only single DES. And that can be cracked in about 12 hours, OK? Instead of a whole year, which is what, what the RSA took. So the Swedes have taken the long approach. They've taken the RSA approach to cracking my code. But, but had they taken this approach, they could have done it in 12 hours. Anybody could have done it in 12 hours. Luckily, nobody thought I could be that stupid, OK? <laughs> so I got away with it. Um, and I think this kind of is a really nice message that goes back to the enigma and your point you were making. It's, it's you know, the theoretical, um, and you all know this as well, you know, it's the, the theoretical um, strength of a cipher system, it, it, you know, is ultimately going to be weakened by the way it's used and who's using it, and particularly if it's me using it. Um, so with that in mind, I think we're out of time. So um, we're supposed to leave you with, with uh, messages at the end of these lectures, and three messages in particular. So uh, regardless of the theoretical security of my cipher challenge, human error undermined it. Regardless of the theoretical security of the Enigma cipher, human error undermined it as well. And regardless of the theoretical security of anybody's encryption, human error will ultimately undermine it if the error is there. Thank you very much for listening, and enjoy the rest of today. Cheerio.